to, uh, to really uh, extend and finish up on the molecules of macrophages that are really, really important, one of the things that came out of the work on the on particularly lipopolysaccharide, uh, LPS, activating mac macrophages to release tumor necrosis factor and um, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 and all these pro-inflammatory cytokines. The question became then around the mid 80s as to what, what, how did LPS do that? LPS being a bacterial cell wall molecule and, and clearly extremely important because, because that was the, what was the culprit according to the clinicians as to what was causing septic shock. And of course, the studies done by Bruce Beutler and Tony Cerami uh, in, the, in the early to mid eighties showed that it wasn't LPS it, per se, it was what LPS did to the cell to make the cell make tumor necrosis factor and so forth. So Bruce Beutler, uh, who's over my shoulder over here, over here. <laughs> he left uh, uh, New York and the Rockefeller and Tony Cerami's lab in 1986 because he was he was offered a, pos a position um, to start his own lab down in University of Texas Southwestern where he had done his clinical training. So he decamped from New York and went down to Dallas and set up shop. And one of the very first things that happened in, the, in this story was is that the, the receptor for tumor necrosis factor was identified and cloned by other people, two other labs simultaneously. And Bruce decided to, to see whether or not he could make a, a um, use the data from that uh, receptor um, identification and so forth to see whether or not he might be able to make a molecule that would bind TNF and therefore block TNF from binding to the, to the target cells. So he, they went about that and, and what they did was they took the external domain of the TNF uh, molecule and the, they complexed that, or the TNF receptor molecule, and they complexed that with the tail end of, a, of an antibody molecule. And all that really does is, is that it makes, makes the whole molecule bigger so that it's not it's so that it's not filtered out by the kidney and it persists in the circulation longer than it would normally and so that that um, molecule that they made they made that in 1991 so bruce had been uh, at dallas for about four or five years when they when they did this work that ended up being a drug that was first licensed to a company called immunex and then which was then acquired by Amgen, and now is the number five best-selling drug in the world. And if you if you watch TV a lot, you'll see uh, Phil Mick Mickelson, the golfer. He's he has rheumatoid arthritis, and he's been on Ambrel forever, and so he's their spokesman to tell you to get on this drug because it's really good and it'll help you play golf and so forth and so on. The next, the other thing that they did early on in Dallas was is that they looked to see it was well known that uh, steroids, glucocorticoids, uh, prednisone, hydrocortisone, and so forth are immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory. But it hadn't been shown, um, well, we had shown back in 1979 that, that glucocorticoids would block the production of interleukin-2 by T cells, T cell growth factor. And they went ahead and, and did similar kinds of studies on macrophages and other kinds of cells that would respond to um, things like LPS. And they showed essentially that um, glucocorticoids would block the production of tumor necrosis factor in much the same way it, it um, had blocked uh, the production of interleukin-2. So the thing about one of the reasons, so, so glucocorticoids are very, potent immunosuppressive agents. The only problem is that glucocorticoids, um, there are receptors for glucocorticoids in all of the cells of the body, including the brain and, and so forth. So if you, if you, if you, um, if you use them um, therapeutically to, to inhibit the immune system, you then start to wreak havoc in, in all kinds of other organ systems in the body. And so chronic, acutely they work really well 
chronically they they are a major problem but anyway they figured out how they work uh, in terms of decreasing those pro-inflammatory cytokines that the macrophages were making so around 1993 um, Bruce decided that the, the most important question that had been unanswered as a consequence of everybody's work but his work in particular was the what was the receptor for lipopolysaccharide uh, on the surface of cells that that the LPS would bind to to make the cells make tumor necrosis factor and so forth. And so the, what he he took advantage of of uh, knowledge that was already out there, and that is is that there was a there was a mutant mouse strain that was unresponsive to LPS. You could give it LPS and it would not go into shock and, and so forth. Um, and and it had they they also had at the same time another mouse strain that that was almost genetically identical to the one that was the mutant, and it and it did respond to LPS. And so, on the basis of that, Bruce decided to take a a um, uh, genetic approach and to try to find the gene that was missing or mutated in the, excuse me. So the next thing that happened um, in, the, in the world of the pro-inflammatory cytokines was the, the major question that was really still unanswered was what was the receptor for LPS or lipopolysaccharide that was on the surface of macrophages that would then, so that once they, saw LPS, then they started to make tumor necrosis factor. And so Bruce decided to take a genetic approach um, to this question. And the reason he did so, because there were two different strains of mice, one that had a mutation in the, in the, in the, in the ability to respond to LPS, they were unresponsive, and another strain of mouse, mice that were responsive. And otherwise they were essentially genetically identical. And so the thing is, back in the early 90s, there, the techniques for, um, for molecular biology were, were still pretty rudimentary. They, they could, they would, you could do a lot, but what he was gonna try to do had never been done before. And, and so he uh, set his course um, and started to work on this because what he was going what he wanted to do was to um, clone, identify and clone the gene out of the total genome of the mouse, which was a, which was a really big deal because of the fact that the, the area that they could genetically map where which chromosome the gene was on, and, and so forth. But it was a really large segment of the chromosome. So it meant that the work to try to identify this was not going to be easy. And it turns out and uh, it wasn't easy. It took him five years. He, they finally got it uh, in 1998. They wrote their paper and then submitted it to science in um, September and it was published in, in December. He had some, he had other people that were crawling up his back at the time, but but in the end, he was he was successful, and he was acclaimed, and everybody was was very very happy. And once that gene had been identified, they went back in, into the um, into their library gene libraries and identified uh, in the mouse um, twelve genes that were analogs of that, and in the human ten. And the question was, when they found all these genes, they said, well, why are there so many of those things? And it turns out that the ligands, the ligands that would bind to these, the, to these other receptor molecules were ligands from other microbes, several from viruses and, um, and other bacteria and so forth. And one of the things that, that um, uh, that was really, really interesting was the fact that the, when they initially found the LPS receptor, they, they it had already been identified in the fruit fly because the geneticists 
had been using the fruit fly since the early 1920s and so forth because they reproduce very, very rapidly. And you could, the fruit flies are tiny little things. I don't know whether you've ever seen one of those flying around your fruit, but yeah, you, they had to look at them with a scanning or a, with, yeah, with, a, with a, a microscope to see what was going on, but they could identify um, phenotypes that were, that were changed as a, as a consequence of, their, of a mutation in the fruit fly. And the, and the gene that was identified was called TLR for toll-like receptor. The fruit fly people had all kinds of funny names for everything. So this was the toll-like receptor, and it turns out that it was already number four that it had been identified in the human. And um, all the rest of there's TLR3, which recognizes double-stranded RNA viruses. And that's why poly-IC and poly-AU, which were double strands of RNA, would would activate TLR3 and then cause the cells to, to make uh, interferon and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then TLR7 would react to single-stranded RNA and do the same thing. And then TLR9 would react to certain sequences in DNA from different bacteria. And so there was a whole cadre of things that became explained by, by Bruce's work. Consequently, in 2011, he was he won the Nobel Prize for that work, and I and of, of all the Nobel prizes that have been given away in, during my professional lifetime, I think his is the most deserved of any of the rest of them, because his stuff was was um, it was really a difficult thing to do technically and intellectually. They had to create their own assays and so forth and so on but they were successful and I and he is really a prince of a scientist and so hats off to him so that's it